Hmm. Well, if it's cakes and cookies, it's more like Hansel and Gretel. And the roots are the witch. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is the thing. Um, those, those exits go out uh, and they, they have microbes growing in them and then they get sucked up like a vacuum, like an anteater sucking up the microbes that are being grown in those exits. And then they get bombarded with superoxide and oxidized. See, everything relates to oxidization and reduction. It's the truth. Um, and they lose their outer walls. And some of them are completely destroyed. Some of them regrow their outer walls and form root hairs. And without microbes, you don't form root hairs. This has been shown with dozens and dozens of plants. This is newer science. I have people who are claiming to have PhDs that are, are, are unaware of this, but this is all well well documented and replicable because Dr. James F. Uh, White is incredible because he gives a, he gives credit to each student for all the parts that they did. And he's got their picture and their name and everything. Excellent professor. He's been at it 40 years. But he also shows you the exact protocol. So each one of his, his papers that they're published, I mean, part of the reason why they go into these big journals is because they're, they're, they are so groundbreaking. But the other part is they're like how-tos. They're like specific, detailed how-tos. And he goes... He's invent. I don't know how many uh, stains he's invented for um, endo endophytic studies, but it's it's remarkable. And he's also a friendly, fun fun guy, and um, we do interviews all the time with them. So this is the primary way that plants feed, because in evolutionary terms, the bacteria and fungi that are the smallest that can go through root meristem cells were here way before protozoa and nematodes. So plant roots developed to develop, they developed it in such a way that they wouldn't need those higher order trophic levels of the soil food web. They evolved with the rise of AG cycle so they can partner with simple yeasts. They can partner with Endophytes that are also saprophytes is a huge overlap between those two. Endophytes are microbes that live inside the plant. Saprophytes are microbes that digest organic matter, um, dead decaying organic matter. And so these microbes, the third group of these microbes, and the reality is, huh, 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 this is a this was something I read over and over and over again when I found it in the literature. Um, and there's whole sections on this now. There's whole book sections on this now. The exudates get reabsorbed because they're reabsorbing with the microbes up to 90%. So it's like a shotgun blast out. It's also secretion and excretion. And some of it, we can't tell which it is. And they're also sloughing off old cells that get counted in this exudation when they do the testing. So this is not as clear. This is a much more complicated field. And also plants are, you know, microbes are, are, are considered tiny animals. And so that makes like plants like not vegan. Um, they are literally feasting and farming on microbes. And 90% of these exudates, these cakes and cookies are being reabsorbed and then um, reprocessed. So it's not cakes and cookies. It's like a fishing reel. Um, it's like uh, they create this field in which plant, um, plant nutrients are liberated because they're releasing those protons, they're releasing these humic acids. So they're changing the pH, they're changing the, the redox and they're liberating nutrients and they're also releasing these sugars at the same time. So in this mixture of all these liberated ions, you have all these microbes feasting and growing and developing, and they're being sucked in as well. And it's a much, it's a much more interesting picture, I think. Uh, and it's a much more like that. That's much more like how nature works, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's pretty wild, wild, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, and the reality is the endophytes are the warriors that survive. 
they go in there and create a shield of fixed nitrogen around themselves. So they like fix nitrogen and we're trying to still figure out because they're inside the plant fixing this nitrogen, right? Where are they fixing this nitrogen from? And, and yes, if you're looking at John Kemp's plant, you know, pyramid health pyramid, you're like, oh, this, they're going to help turn your, your nitrogen into amino acids and help process your nitrogen. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, and, and I think that's what we're seeing happen when we treat our plants with EM though. The, um, but I think that certain microbes do it better than other microbes. And there's a whole fleet of microbes that are endophytes and all of them have to fix nitrogen. So, so we, we, we know they fix nitrogen. Um, we've seen it, we've tracked it. Uh, the only thing right now is knowing exactly where they're pulling it from, which is hard to track, but it is so cool about all this stuff is that it, every new step of the way we get another clue and it's a thrilling, thrilling story unfolding before our eyes and those of us in soil science. I mean, we can't stop talking about all this stuff. We can't stop, you know, just texting each other, sending each other new studies because um, we're going to unlock plant health and food health and at such a high level. I mean, think about this. When they talk about how our food is less nutritious, um, just go back to the monosaccharide polysaccharide thing. Imagine if your fruits... Um, and your vegetables, uh, instead of being heavy on the monosaccharide side, were heavy on the polysaccharide side. Oh, wait, polysaccharides are the medicinal ones. Oh, wait, polysaccharides are the ones that are charged with energy. There's a reason why, well, I'm not going to get into that right now, but th that's a seed I'm planting for you, okay? That's a seed, because there's a whole world attached to that that I'm going to write about in mind, body, and soil. But what does this look like in real life, Matt? Come on, come on. Can we, uh, the first time I went to look for it, I found it. I did this with pumpkins. And cause I, I was like, you know, pumpkins got those big, those big features, you know, big roots, big seeds, um, big root hairs make it very easy to visualize. And I've got so many different kinds of seeds that I like testing out and trying things. And I think maybe in universities, they don't do that enough. Um, and so uh, this, this is something that, which is so wild that like everyone can confirm this. Everyone can replicate this because of the way Dr. James White wrote his study. And it's wild to me that I'll post things sometimes. And I think they're trolls, to be honest. I, I think the people being like, I've never heard of rhizophagy, endophytic nitrogen. I have a PhD. Like, like there are people like on, it, it's always on Facebook. <laughs> um uh on youtube it's completely different um that's why i'm doing my lives here and not on facebook um but like there's these like really questionable profiles and i think they're trolls and i mean we wonder why citizen scientists like william Padilla brown um people who have green deserts uh like neil speckman are having people impersonate them and try to poach their their people and ask them for money like terrible things disgusting things and and it, there's the we're conceivably possibly we are under attack because this information is so disruptive um we no longer will need the fertilizer companies you will no longer need the pesticide companies the insecticide the fungicides forget all that big chem is would take a huge hit um and and then suddenly local economies would boom everywhere and they become strong. And so that's the strong voting base. You know, you know, you know, independence is what led to, you know, being actually independent as communities is what led to independence um, as a nation. So uh, I, I, I don't know what's happening, but, but that's what people are saying. That's what it appears like. And that's why I continue to show this information because I don't know when I'm going to be, I, I mean, I, I am shadow banned on Instagram. I, I, that much is very, very clear. As of this morning, it was very, very clear with what they were doing. I, I couldn't comment. Um, so 
So I just want to get this information out so that people know, so that people can start connecting these things because it's going to change all of our medicine, all of our food, all of our reality. And we're going to get more into it right now because it keeps going. <laughs> so here's the actual picture from the actual slide. Uh, this is with um, Blue Methylin, baby. Yeah. And um, this is, don't worry, this is not the same Blue Methylin that I'm using on the slide. But... It is blue methylene. There you go. The mysteries continue. And you can just see it. These, these microbes are, are, are being released from the root hairs after they've passed through in rhizophagy. And then mycorrhizae and rhizobia. You guys probably know about these. We're inoculating our peas and beans and clover so they form nodules. That's scotch broom on the right. Scotch broom is fascinating. I could go on and on about scotch broom. It has bulk holderia in it, as well as rhizobia. So you could put it in with your inoculation. You could crush up the, the nodules and put it in when you're inoculating your beans that you're going to be planting and have, you know, travel between. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, um, and then you could be coating your, your roots with ecto or endomycorrhizae. You could be um, partnering with them and, and having incredible things happen. That's what this actually looks like. <laughs> the thing is, when you have our buscular mycorrhizal fungi working with your roots, you increase phosphorus uptake by 10,000 times. Imagine that, 10,000 times. I mean, it, it makes these all these like peak phosphorus nonsense just look so silly. And if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back to the video we released last week. Uh, the first in this series on this, and, and you'll find all the information that you need. So what about those plant root hairs, Matt? Yes, they have life in them too. And, and that's part of the nitrogen cycle. Um, they're going to be taking in, you know, there, there are estimates and there are some testing and it between the roots and, and the leaves, it's up to 82%. And that's what we can measure. So we might be missing things that we're not catching. And so it could be 100%. It's really, really amazing what we can do with, with microbes. And what Dr. James White also discovered is all the plant hairs, all the trichomes, as they're called, on all plants. He tested over, a, over 30 different species. And he found nitrogen-fixing bacteria and fungal communities inside all the hairs. And he jokingly, because he's been doing all these cannabis cultivation talks, um, he jokingly said that, you know, all those cannabis growers are smoking microbes. And I thought that was the wildest thing. And then like, we're talking to like to other folks and it's like, well, you know, microbes are the things that are synthesizing the vitamins that are in our plants. So the terpenes are coming from the microbes and and then Jeff Lowenfels is like, well, I think of it as messages and the terpenes are actually language messages between different microbes. And that's why different microbes lead to different tro uh, terpene profiles. Man, I was in an interview yesterday, a long format, like two hour interview, and and they were talking about how cannabis cultivators are and have been the cutting edge for the past 40 years in agriculture but they've been underground for most of it because, and they haven't been able to talk about their findings. And now that it's coming to the fore, it's informing everything. And uh, I, I feel very, very lucky to have been in that community of growers. Some of my best friends in California were deeply involved in that. Siobhan Brady, um, Quatamuk Via, that's what he was doing all the EM and cannabis cultivation or I, I think over 10 years, I think over 15 years, actually, and maybe 20 years. I, I, I actually don't know how long. Um, one of my best friends created the first sun-grown commercial variety in all of Can California at the first dispensary, uh, d the close family friend, you know? And so this, this community, I, I feel very lucky that I was always a part of. I never... I, I was always friends of the cultivators. And so we always talk, talk, we always got deep with the science and then they would bring me into these situations and I would learn with these folks. 
that were doing incredible things, creating feral cannabis that was, uh, they were creating an entire forest of cannabis that was feral and was um, making seeds and buds on the same plant and would grow back every single year like a perennial and was mold free despite all the fogs. And, and so th they're doing incredible things. Um, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> tangent, Matt. Mm -hmm. Plants are active, passive, and reactive. And just like with those, that, that cannabis perennial forest, people are perennializing plants. People are, are partnering with the microbes and getting them to, to, to increase medicinal value in not just cannabis, but everything. Um, folks are like, like Steve Raisner are, are figuring out how they can get involved in the supplement world with the dual root zone. You gotta have that soil there in order to do aquaponics properly. That was his breakthrough. And, and we're realizing that these plants are so reactive, so incredible when, you're, when you recognize all these aspects. Because think about it this way. If we just thought, think of plants as purely passive individuals, we don't give them the autonomy. We do too much for them. But if we don't think of plants as active, then we don't realize that they can make good choices if they're given the, the, the right context. And if we don't recognize that plants are reactive, we can't trigger the right things to, to cause the plant to be extra active or extra aware or conscious, so to speak, of, of what can happen. Like, like we can trigger the immunological response of a plant. And so suddenly more aware of itself um, in terms of, of its immune system. But this understanding of plants has never been brought together. And it's so critical. Um, I, it's so important to understand this, that the plants are not directly in control of their exudation, their excretion, they're just coming out of them. And they are active when they're interacted with and they're seeking things out. They have behaviors, they have instincts and they have click war responses that they can't control. If you trigger it, it happens. Just like with with SAR and ISR with immunologically, you know, triggered responses in the plant so that th they, they go to a next level of health and they, they have higher color, uh, uh, they have brighter colors, they have a more extreme and intense flavors. This, this is really important to recognize each of these aspects and the limitations and boundaries around each of these aspects so that you treat and manage your plants properly. Because there are these ideas that it's just this one thing. You just need to do this one thing. Oh, the plant's in control. If you just give the plant this, it'll be magic. Um, we have to understand. We have to know. And that's what's so cool about, you know, that cannabis community is they tested. They tested and showed each other their tests. And like then did contests, like the, 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 cannabis, the compost cannabis cup. Uh, I was talking to Chandler at Wormies because all these people were coming to me, Quatermock Via, you know, because he was watching, he, uh, I think it was the Future Cannabis channel. He was watching them talk about my book and Chandler being like, this is what we're doing. Found it in this book. We're doing it now. It works amazingly. We've got the best compost that we've ever found, the highest fungal count that we've ever found. And so it's all full circle. We're all connecting and, and, and it's, it's really working. People are finding incredible value in it. So these microbes are being digested. They're being stripped and restored. They're being forced to fix nitrogen. They're being partnered with, and they're also being beneficially coexisted with because there's saprophytes feeding on those cells, those sloughed off um, root cells that are just there. They're being fed upon. And the actual you know, process of those things being part of the soil food web chain of events they they get that 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 eventual nutrient back so <clears throat> they're not directly feeding off of them they're beneficially coexisting with them and there's also other things that they're beneficially coexisting with that are like nitrogen fixers that are saprophytes that don't need to be even like directly in the meristem or they're too big to fit through the meristem there's like a lot of stuff going on that's like oh there's this there's that and there's that there's, it's all happening. If we can get our soil right, 
We can grow amazing food, raise amazing animals. We skip the pests, the diseases, the viruses, and soil damage. We instead focus on making things better and better. So our food yields and nutrition continue to improve exponentially with every single season. Learn to understand soil from the micro to the macro, down to the individual microbes, ions, and enzymes, and how they directly relate to hands-on action and pragmatic strategies for our farms, fields, and gardens. We can grow food faster with higher yields and nutritional density, but it all comes down and comes back to your soil. Is it resilient? Is it regenerative? Join us this September 5th and change the way you see the world, food, soils, and everything and how it relates. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And click that link. Join us this season. Don't miss out.